Oh, am I not supposed to adjust? Sorry. I'm so used to adjusting at our church, um, so apologize, media team. Uh, thank you for uh, just having me here uh, this morning, uh, New Life, and uh, I just want to thank the, the staff and the deacons and uh, the elders that were uh, really hospitable in uh, welcoming our family this whole weekend. Um, they've gone beyond uh, just what we uh, normally expect during our travel. Uh, for example, uh, we're a family of five, so we're used to staying uh, in a pretty uh, tight space <laughs> because I'm too cheap to run two rooms or uh, get a suite. So we're usually not sleeping well, but uh, they got us a nice suite with you know, plenty of uh, space uh, for us to rest. So it's, it's been really good. Uh, my youngest uh, made a comment. He said, uh, Daddy, can we always stay like this? And I'm like, probably not. You know, We might have to go back to our old ways. But uh, uh, really thankful for our time. And uh, thank you for the privilege of uh, bringing the God uh, bringing us uh, the Word of God this morning. Let me uh, just, uh, can we all stand as we read uh, James chapter 2, verses 19 through 27. I don't know if you guys normally stand, but uh, it's a great way to recognize uh, that this is a time that we're reading uh, God's holy and inerrant Word. So let's do that together. Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not brittle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this to visit orphans and widows in their affliction, and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Amen. Let's, uh, you may be seated. Uh, November 2nd, 2016 uh, was a special day for me. Uh, it was a day that the Chicago Cubs defeated the Cleveland Indians 8-7 to in a 10-inning game. I don't know if you guys are baseball fans. I know... Uh, Martin is uh, uh, a huge Dodgers fan. Maybe some of you guys are uh, as well. But it was an exciting day because finally the Cubs uh, broke the long drought that they have been enduring since 1908. Now think about how long that is. And as you could imagine, uh, the city of Chicago was flooded with Cubs gear all around. Everywhere you went, literally the next day, Dick's Sporting Goods was sold out of all the, the... the Cubs gear, and uh, all you see everywhere you go uh, were Chicagoans uh, wearing Cubs gear. Now, I've been a Cubs fan uh, pretty much my whole life, enduring all the losing seasons year after year, being the lovable losers, coming close at times only to lose. Uh, Even the day that I proposed to my wife, uh, we were on this romantic cruise ship, and this should be one of the happiest days of my life, I know. Uh, but I remember as I, as I was celebrating with her, I took a peek at the Cubs score. And uh, this was the famous uh, uh, Steve Bartman incident uh, where it cost us, you know, possi- possibly uh, uh, the, the World Series titles, uh, title that we should have won. Uh, it would have been a g- great day, I guess. Uh, but it was kind of tainted by my experience of how the Cubs uh, lost. Now, why am I talking about the Cubs, right, especially in front of, you know, many Dodgers fans? Uh, Because one of the things I noticed during that time, the year that after Cubs won, was the fact uh, that you wouldn't be able to tell just by walking around who the true Cubs fans are, right? Because everyone uh, during that time, they were so happy uh, about cheering for the Cubs, whether they were really, you know, Cubs fans or not, uh, whether, you know, they were, you know, bandwagon fans, whatever, Uh, they were all wearing Cubs gear, and you wouldn't know if they were truly a fan. But don't you think if you're a true fan of the Cubs, 
Don't you think you would know who the players are? Don't you think the true fans would be ones that actually attend the game, participate in a lot of things, uh, you know, to know about the players? Aren't there certain things that a true Cubs fans would know that would separate them from other casual fans? I think so, but who's to say and determine what that cri- criteria is for a true fan? And I was thinking about that because in today's text, James is addressing this difficult question, question of discerning. How can a person truly know if they are believers. And unlike the arbitrary discussion a person can have about determining what constitutes a true sports fan, James here in today's text gives us a couple points about how a person is saved and what this saved person looks like that I hope can be an encouragement to all of us, but not only an encouragement, but a sobering uh, a reminder for us to really check and examine our hearts to see where we are. And in this, we'll learn a proper relationship that exists between faith and works that James talks about. So we'll take a look at three points. Third point is more of an application. But first point is obedience is an outflow of the transformation that has taken place inside. Obedience is an outflow of the transformation that has taken place inside. In other words, the work we do does not define who we are. But I don't know about you, we often associate when we hear about works and obedience, we automatically kind of jump to that superficial level of trying to deal with it with a behavioral change. Yet the first thing that James is pointing out for us in this section on hearing and doing is that the process of hearing and doing begins with a heart change that only God can do. If you look with me in verse 18 in the previous section that leads to the text that we have just read this morning, is that the word of truth, the gospel, is a perfect gift that you and I have received. And our actions that we do is a result of what has taken place of that gospel work in our hearts. 18, it says, of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. And this is reiterated again in verse 21 that we are to receive with meekness or another word in humility in realizing what we need more than anything else in our lives is his word, which is able to save our souls. His word, the gospel, is what we need to receive in our hearts first before we could even think about learning how we could hear and obey, which means biblical obedience for us begins in the heart. And it's about what he has done in our hearts that define who we are and not the works that we do. Now, we know this, don't we? If you have been under, you know, Pastor Will's teaching, I'm sure he has preached this over and over. But how often do we see or associate obedience as a heart issue? Because if you're like me, especially for us as parents, Isn't it tempting for us to go directly to behavioral change that needs to be addressed? If my kids aren't listening, what's the first thing that I do? I'll be honest, uh, coming here, uh, I I had a chat with, you know, my boys. Uh, Three boys, I know some of you guys have, you know, uh, three boys, and I I met a family who has four boys, God bless you. Uh, I wouldn't be able to do it, but it's hard having three boys. And they're here, and it's okay, because they they know I've shared it many times uh, in front of people. But I I, I told them, as we're meeting a lot of people, you know, at a new church, I said, guys, please, daddy's begging you. Can you guys just be quiet, please? (laughs) Can you guys just not be loud? Can you guys not punch each other, please, in front of other people? Please. What am I getting at? I just want them to change their behavior so that superficially... (laughs) You guys think I have a perfect family, right? But what do I need to address as a parent? It's the heart change, heart transformation that is needed that James is pointing out. But when we don't see it that way, the danger behind seeing obedience on a superficial level is that we dress nothing more than a behavioral modification than a heart transformation that is needed that James is pointing out for us in verse 21. The word we are to receive with meekness, humility, 
that saves is the good news of the gospel that we sang about all morning in our liturgy. That's what we were reminded of. That we're not saved by anything that we do, but by placing our faith in what Christ has done for us. And that's where obedience begins, in the heart that only God could address. It's not trying to figure out what would Jesus do. I remember when, you know, the WWJD bracelet was really popular, right? Uh, It was really, you know, emphasizing the the ethical imperatives that we are to uh, try to figure out. What would Jesus do in this situation? And for us to try to figure out. But the gospel tells us it's not so much about what would Jesus do, but it's about what Jesus has already done for us. That is the root of our obedience that we need to think about. James is laying down the foundation of our obedience, which begins at the heart. That's the first point that we see. Second, true transformation shapes how we live. It's about who we are in our identity that shapes and motivates our actions. Because if it's not what we do that saves, but it's by faith in what Christ has done, that faith has led to us having new identity that has been established in Christ. And having that new identity in Christ is what motivates and shapes the things that we do. So then obedience doesn't just become a superficial behavioral change, but obedience is an identity issue that James is pointing out that all of us can get, uh, need to be reminded of. The imperative command that he calls us to do in verse 22, to be doers of the word, is in response to what God has already done for us through his word that is in us, that has transformed our hearts. And as he has transformed our hearts, it has given us a new identity that is about uh, what he has established for us in his great, sovereign, creative design to do good works for him. And we need to understand this point clearly because what James calls us to do in response to us understanding our identity is that now, if you are truly saved, if God has done that transforming work in your heart, then what that looks like are people that are living their lives for his glory and for his uh, purpose in doing good works. Because if we don't get this point right, James may seem to come off as contradicting his own statement. But you said we're not saved and defined by the works we do, but you're saying Who we are defines what we do. That's exactly what James is trying to establish. This new identity that has been given to us is about living for him. There's no other way around. He's uh, he's trying to lay down the proper relationship that exists between faith and works. Because true saving faith that James is pointing out is never alone. Because those that are saved, have been saved to do good works. And to make this point, James in 23, 24 tries to illustrate this point uh, through a man who looks himself in a mirror, who what, he walks away, forgets what he looks like. Now, think about how ridiculous this example is. For anyone who has spent any time looking at themselves in a mirror, right? And if you find a, a blemish in your face, what do you do? Do you see a zit on your face and do you say, oh, Okay, I have a zit on my face. I just walk away, and you forget about it. Or for me sometimes, uh, my nose hair would grow, and I would catch myself, you know, with one long nose hair that's sticking out. I don't say, oh, okay, I see a nose hair sticking out. Great. And I walk away and completely forget about it. No, it doesn't matter how busy I am, right? It's not until I pluck that out or I address the issue that I will... Uh, um, do something about. And I think that's precisely what James is trying to get at. When the gospel goes in our hearts, his living word is so powerful and effective and effectual in transforming our lives that what comes out is nothing but to do all things for his glory. And we become doers Not because we have done it to become, but because we have been saved to become doers. And I think that's what James is trying to make uh, the point here 
when the word of God goes in, the power of the gospel at work in transforming us is so powerful that what flows from that are living our lives and doing good works. Those that have been saved have been transformed by the powerful work of the gospel in us, brothers and sisters. This power takes us from death to life, from old life to new life, from being slaves to sin to being slaves to righteousness. The transformation that's taking place through the gospel now frees us from doing what our old nature craved to having this new nature that is found in our new identity in Christ that is about living for him. That's what Romans 6, 15 and 19, Paul is talking about. Are we to sin because we're not under law but under grace? By no means, no. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, having become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. This is Apostle Paul who is writing this letter to the Roman church who knows a thing about complete transformation. Paul was also known as Saul who persecuted the Christians, whose mission, as Acts 9-1 tells us, was breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. His whole mission in life was to destroy Christianity, but when he was confronted by the Lord himself, he was transformed. And he was baptized, and he had a new purpose, new mission for his life, which was no longer about persecuting Christians, but proclaiming the gospel, the good news. Paul, like us, didn't do any works that led to him being saved, but the works he did in response to God's saving grace in his life was precisely what James is pointing out that you and I have been saved to do. Paul was chosen and saved for this good work of preaching the good news of the gospel. And brothers and sisters at New Life Press, the reminder for us is that you and I have also been given a new identity in Christ that is to be lived out for his purpose, for his glory. Have we forgotten we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. This is who we are. We have been set free from the bondage to idols that Pastor Will explored in the idol series, right? I was really thankful to have uh, gone through uh, the sermon series myself, and I was blessed and challenged by how so many different ways that we can get busy in living our lives for. A lot of those idols have been distracting us from this purpose that James is reminding us that we have been created in Christ Jesus to do. Amen? Obedience to his word is what James is reminding us that we have been created to do. Some of us, I think, are suffering from spiritual amnesia where I think we have forgotten who we really are, right? Right? Because we're so busy trying to live our lives for so many different things that may tempt us and distract us. But our identity has been established in Christ Jesus for good works. There's a children's book titled, Are You My Mother? I don't know if some of you kids uh, remember uh, reading that or being read by your parents. Or some of you parents might remember reading it. Uh, I liked that book because it was short, and uh, I could tell my wife I read it, and uh, the boys could go to sleep. Uh, but it has a good story that I, I, I want to try to relate to uh, what uh, we're talking about here. But the story is about a hatching bird who hatches while the mother is away. 
uh, finding food. And the story is about this baby bird that is going around trying to find who his mother is and trying to find who he is and his identity. But he doesn't know because he doesn't know what his mother looks like nor what he's supposed to look for. So in this book, the baby bird is going around trying to search for his mother and finding his identity. And he tries to do that by thinking, hey, am I a kitten? Am I a hen? Am I a dog? Am I a cow? Am I a car, boat, a plane? He was so confused, and he didn't know who he was until he found his mother. And once he found his mother, he realized who he was. And perhaps some of us, like the baby bird, have forgotten who we are. And we have been wandering around aimlessly trying to find our purpose and meaning in all the wrong places that have made us forget who we are, what we're called to do. We're like the person in a mirror, deceiving ourselves and thinking that we could just hear and forget. Or we're too busy trying to find meaning and purpose through many different things that we're chasing after. But the gracious reminder this morning for us is this. Unlike the person who forgets, is in contrast to a blessed person that James pictures for us in verse 25. And what does this person look like? This person is one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres. Being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts. This is not someone who does all this in order to be saved, but because he has been saved, he understands who he is and who he's living for. Brothers and sisters, how close is the word of God in your life? James says the one who possess this true saving faith are those who look into the perfect law. The law of liberty and perseveres in becoming a doer who acts. Not someone who listens well. Not someone who sits there and critiques, oh, that sermon was good or bad but someone who hears and acts in response to all that God has revealed for us and done for us. The good works we do is an evidence of that transforming work of the gospel in us. I think this is where uh, Westminster Confession of Faith in chapter 16 does a good uh, job of uh, just kind of uh, conveying this important point about how the works we do is an evidence of that fruit that is in us. In section two, it reads, these good works done in obedience to God's commandments are the fruits and evidences of a true and lively faith. And by them, believers manifest their thankfulness, strengthen their assurance, edify their brethren, adorn the profession of the gospel, stop the mouth of the adversaries, glorify God who workmanship they are created in Christ Jesus thereunto, that having their fruit unto holiness they may have the end, eternal life. The good works we do, as imperfect as it may be, is not only done for God's glory, but for our good. It's for us to know that the good works we do in response to what he has done for us is that evidence of that transforming work of the gospel in us. That's what we see in the second point. The third point and this is more of an application as, as I try to uh, wrap up. It'll be sad for us to hear all of this and walk out and do nothing about it, right? But what does this text call us to do? In response to that saving work of the gospel in us, for those who profess and possess this true saving faith, it means that we respond actively hearing and obeying the gospel. It means that we're more than just casual listeners sitting on our couch online thinking, okay, well, I sat down, I, I, I watched the service online, I'm good. But it's about hearing that leads to doing. Don't make the mistake of thinking coming to church on Sundays is all about just listening to good sermons. As important as that part is in us listening, it's about learning how to listen that leads to doing. And this is where Alistair Begg, a pastor, warns 
about merely listening and not doing it. This is what he says that I found helpful. He says, the more we listen to it without being changed by it, the less likely we will be changed by it. This was his observation after pastoring for 30 years, where he says he could pick out individuals who consistently attend to listen to the Bible without being changed and transformed by it because they have become hardened to the truth they hear. They have become familiar with it and even can say it's beneficial, but it was no use to them. Does this describe some of us in our listening? Maybe some of us, we grew up in the church, and we heard of the gospel, and we know that we need to be doing. But the sobering reminder for us is that we're called to be more than just casual listeners. Don't let another Sunday go by without us developing the spiritual muscle that is needed for us to be better listeners. The kind of listening, listening we ought to practice that James talks about is listening that leads to obedience. I think this is maybe uh, one of the lingering effect the pandemic has left on us as we have been going through online service. I'm so glad that we get, uh, we get to worship uh, in person but haven't we become so comfortable in becoming casual listeners? Kind of making Sunday a checklist of what we do online or maybe perhaps even in person. But the challenge for us is to examine our hearts and reflect on how we have been approaching Sunday service, not just to tickle our ears, but to hear and obey. That's the first thing. Uh, second is to obey the gospel. Now, James concludes in verses 26 and 27 with what this active participation in obeying the gospel looks like. And it has two components. First is inward, and the second is outward. Where, where, where do we see the inward? The inward act of obeying the gospel is dealing with our hearts in regards to our personal holiness that we need to actively reconcile in our lives. Look what it says in 26. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not brittle his tongue but deceives his heart. This person's religion is worthless. Now, he's talking about the things that are coming out of our mouth, right, in our speech. But I, would, I don't want us to just limit it as speech as James is talking about, but think about the co conduct in our living. Our conduct is a reflection of our hearts. Because he says, if anyone thinks he is religious and does not control his tongue, he deceives his heart. It's a heart issue because what comes out is a reflection of what's inside, which means the inward work that we are to pursue and work on in our lives and obey actively is a heart change that is needed. And how can the heart be changed? As we were reminded, oh, it's only through the gospel. It means be rooted in the gospel to remind ourselves of the good news that we find in the gospel and all the liturgy that we sing and read about is pointing to that great work of the gospel in us in transforming us, giving us new life. But just because we're reminded of that does not mean that we are continuing to live in that holiness that God calls us to. So we strive for that, reminding ourselves of the gospel. The in-work work of obeying the gospel is to reconcile the sin that we need to recognize, repent, and be assured of as we repent and turn away. So that's the inward obedience that I see from this text. But not only inward, but it has an outward component. And here the practical religion that is pure and undefiled that James points to is one who visits the orphans and widows in their affliction. This is what many church label as the mercy ministry where it involves organizations like Love Fullerton that I believe your church uh, is involved uh, in amongst other uh, opportunities that you guys might have in serving the needs of your community. Now, I didn't, you know, uh, Deacon Danny didn't bribe me to kind of, you know, put in the plug for the mercy ministry that he is very passionate about. Uh, yesterday, I had an opportunity to meet him, and it was just a, you know, we're just having a very casual, uh, casual conversation, and mercy ministry came up. 
And man, he was passionate about mercy ministry because he went on and on. Not in a bad way, sorry. It, it sounds really bad. I'm not, I'm not saying it in that way. But I walked away thinking, man, this person is passionate about this ministry. And I was thinking, do we have that kind of passion to think about others in need that we are to reach out and minister to? Because it would be so sad if Deacon Danny is the only one that is passionate about serving the community here at New Life Press. It would be so sad if he's asking for volunteers and it becomes more of a chore, okay, I'll do it so that he doesn't bother me anymore. I'll do it because I see that the gospel that is in me transformed my heart to not only think about my heart that was changed, but heart that needs to be changed to all those that need to hear the good news of the gospel. So if mercy ministry becomes an extension of what I could do to reach out to ultimately share the gospel, then I would do it. As uncomfortable as it may be, I would do it. Why? Because that's precisely the heart that God had for us in in redeeming all those that were in need. And all those that are his were called to live lives that reflect him and how that is to be lived out in thinking about how to love others as he has loved us. Matthew 20, 28 says, Even as a son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's what we're called to do. You know what that is? That's a great commandment. It's a simple command to obey here that is about inward and outward. It's a great commandment that we're called to do, which is you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So the question I have for us as we close, how would we respond to hearing? Are we going to just hear and say, ah, okay, that message was okay? Or are we going to hear and say, there's so many things that God is challenging me to obey. What might some of those things be in your life? Uh, for my 30th birthday, which was a long time ago, <laughs> uh, my wife surprised me with one of the most uh, memorable birthday gifts I've received, which was a trip to Vegas, a surprise trip. And she was saving, you know, her money uh, on the side so I wouldn't know. And uh, she said, hey, honey, I found babysitters, just me and you. We're going to go uh, to Vegas for a weekend. And she uh, planned all that because one of the things – uh, I really love uh, are listening to the Beatles, and uh, they have that show called The Love uh, by Beatles, uh, and she said, I got tickets, and this is going to be an awesome weekend for us, and I was really excited, and not only because we're without kids, uh, but, you know, I get to watch uh, The Love show. So uh, the whole trip, and mind you, we're in our 30s, so, uh, you know, being a, a seminarian, uh, we didn't really have a lot of money, so there's not much we could do. Uh, in our 30s. So we, only thing we actually had planned for that whole weekend was on the last night we were going to go see this show, Love. So first couple days, you know, we spent that time going to the outlet mall, walking around the strip, you know, eating in and out, you know, doing what we can to pass time. But I didn't care because on the last night we got to watch the show. So that day finally come, uh, comes and uh, we're, uh, you know, I, I believe it was at the Mirage, and, you know, we're walking into uh, the entrance, uh, and one of the attendants uh, asked us, hey, what show are you seeing? And we gave him the ticket, and he says, oh, go to the right and just wait there, and the show will start. So we're waiting. The uh, show was supposed to start at 7 o'clock, and it's like 6.45, and no one's allowed to go in. I'm like, okay. Uh, I didn't think, you know, peop- you know the, the show's... 
uh, like this would uh, go late. But I'm like, all right. So 7 o'clock comes, nothing. I'm like, this is weird, but everyone's still waiting. You know, we're around all these other people that are waiting as well. 7.15, nothing. I'm like, man, this is really weird. But finally, like 7.20, 7.30 is when they started letting uh, people in. So as we're walking in, I show them our ticket uh, to the show. And the attendant goes to me, oh, sir, this is the Ray Romano comedy show. I'm like, what? This isn't love? Because the attendant told me to come here and wait for this. He said, no, that show already started at 7 o'clock. So at this point, what am I going to do? It's not like I'm going to go in the, you know, to the show halfway through. My wife, who worked so hard to plan for this, is crying because she's so sad. I want to cry, but I can't because, you know, like somebody has to, you know, figure out what we're going to do. It was one of the worst feelings that Helen and I experienced. And I remember thinking, man, we were in the show waiting like everyone else. But what happened? We happened to be waiting for the wrong show at the wrong place. And I was thinking about that because I think there's too many people that go to church thinking going to church, listening to sermons is enough. If I just stick around, do good things that all Christians do, that's enough for me to be saved. If my kids are listening to good sermons at Sunday school, that'll be enough. But you know what James tells us? The only that you and I are saved is by the transforming work of the gospel that only God could do. So if there are some of us that are thinking the doing is what leads to the saving faith, the gracious reminder that James is pointing out for us is that we're saved by grace alone, faith alone, and in Christ alone. So we place all our confidence and what Christ has done for us. But this saving faith is never alone. Why? Because this work of the gospel that is in us causes us, as that change is taking place in who we are, to live our lives for him. And the works we do is an evidence of that work that Christ has done for us. So the warning for some of us that are casually listening and attending. Do you know that we're saved by what Christ has done for us? Place all your confidence in his work. And that's it. There's no good works that lead to us being saved other than what Christ has done. But some of us that are believers that have casually approached how we respond to his saving grace in our lives, is what are we doing in our lives to live for him? You have been given a new purpose, new life, that is about living for him and his glory. May we be reminded and find strength in the good news of the gospel to be motivated and fueled by the gospel to live our lives fully obeying all that he commands for his glory. Let's pray. Father, thank you that although we're like the orphans and widows that are helpless, that are in need, Yet you thought of us, and you saved us, and you rescued us when we had nothing to give, nothing to offer, but out of your mercy and grace, you have chosen us to be saved. So thank you for that great reminder that we find in the gospel, but may that reminder also fuel motivate our response and our living and not just being satisfied and being merely hearers 
but doers. And I want to obey the gospel. So strengthen us. And we know that you'll strengthen us as this work that you have called to do is not for us to do on our own, but by faith and by our union with the one who has conquered sin and death for us so that we may live this new life for him. So thank you for that great reminder. Strengthen us. In Jesus' name we pray.